Your Excellency, the Honorable Governor of Maharashtra, the Chief Guest, Dr. Hindu Sahani, the Sheriff of Bombay, Dr. Murray Devra, the Honorable Minister of Petroleum and Natural Gas of the Union Cabinet, Dr. Manzar Khan, the Managing Director of uh, the Oxford University Press, Neena Patel, Editor of the Times of India, thank you very much indeed for your kind words and for the peers of praise lavished upon me. And my dear old friend, Dr. Ingwala, a surgeon of class and distinction who works with the poorest of the poor in South India at a mission hospital. Friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, for a long time I had a desire to write on the non-technical aspects of it. Quasi philosophical aspects. And also the relation of medicine to other fields of human endeavor. I have worked more than 50 years, to be exact, over 52 years as a consultant physician in this city. A long time. And there has been a tremendous change in the face of medicine on the face of medicine. What is that due to? Unquestionably, it is due to the tremendous advances of technology and science. Technology, science in relation to medicine that has revolutionized medicine. Frontiers of medicine have been pushed forwards, creeping forwards right up to the horizon. I need not belabor the fact that modern medicine has brought great benefits to mankind. You know it, your friends know it, your relatives know it. But unwittingly, the advances in the scientific aspect of medicine seem to have submerged its art. It is as if the weight of science has buried its art. I call it the forgotten art. I only hope it doesn't become the lost art. We see today, therefore, science and medicine linked together very strongly. But when medicine is filled with science and bereft of art, it loses its human touch. It loses its humanism. Doctors, therefore, tend to relate more to patients, more to, more to machines and sophisticated gadgetry than to patients. And incredibly, the patient is also often made to relate more to the machine than to the doctor. And what effect does that have? It erodes the doctor-patient relationship. It breaks the doctor-patient relationship. The empathy that a doctor should have for a patient goes, is lacking. And the trust which a patient has for a doctor is also sadly absent. This is indeed extremely disturbing. Is it any wonder that there is a simmering discontent against medicine and the medical profession, not only in this country, but in this whole world. For after all, the doctor-patient relationship is the core of it. It's the heart of it. It's the heart around which layers of medicine have been built by great men and women all through the ages, ever since the dawn of civilization. This non-humanistic medicine, if I may be allowed to coin this word, is of recent origin. It has no past. It has no philosophy. 
It has no cultural language. It would teach the doctor to be like the doctor who is by asking him to surf the net, to read stencil notes, or perhaps to learn the answers to 10,000 multiple choice questions. The teacher in medicine seems to have forgot, not all, but many, that medicine is not learned from books, but at the bedside of patients. What is this art that I've been talking about? I'm afraid it's very difficult to qualify, to quantify, even to articulate. I made a valiant attempt to write about it. I've called it The Forgotten Art of Healing. That's the title of the first essay, and that's how the book gets its title. I can remember a few odd sentences of what I've written. I think Lena has already mentioned some of them. I'd like to repeat some of them, if I may. The art of medicine is looking at a patient holistically, not just the body, but also the mind. The art of medicine is the art of healing, not just treating, not even just curing. But it is only when the art and science join hands that healing really is accomplished. It is only then that a physician can gain access, evaluate the individuality, the unique individuality of each patient. So that the patient means much, much more than the disease he has or the illness that is waiting to be cured. I'd like to mention some of the other essays. You all know that medicine has been influenced by many human endeavors, most of all, of course, by science. Medicine has been influenced by philosophy, to start with, by religion, by economics, by social forces, by history, geography, art, literature, by natural disasters, and by the rise and fall of mighty civilizations. I chose to delve into the relationship of medicine with art and religion. I don't mean the visual art alone. I mean all forms of art, literature, poetry, and most important of all, and perhaps the greatest of all, music. And I purposely wanted to delve into a problem or into an aspect of this relationship. I wanted to know and read and research whether suffering and agony in an artist, either as a result of madness, near madness, physical disease like tuberculosis, physical defects like blindness or deafness, or physical deformities, did they influence some of these artists? Did they ignite their inspiration so that they produced great art, art which, was, which stopped you in your tracks and transported you almost into another world? I won't go into the details of that. I've given many examples. But I think it did. Could you imagine Beethoven writing the Ninth Symphony? painting the whole spectrum of human emotions central to our existence had he not been there. Could you imagine Milton writing Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained if he had not been blind? Or Keats writing his beautiful lyrical poetry, his ode to the nightingale, for example, where he sings the praise of life, of living, of wanting to live, and yet knows that dissolution is around the corner. Would he have done this or written this had he not known that he was going to die of tuberculosis in a very short time? Would Van Gogh have painted those gorgeous canvases, yellows that leap like flames from the canvas onto the beholder had he not suffered from a manic depressive psychosis? And would Byron have been as bionic 
if he had not suffered from a congenital club foot, which he hated every day of his living life. I came to the rather unusual conclusion that it is a paradox of human existence that agony and suffering should be able to create gems of such magnificent transcendence. I then took the subject of religion. Everyone knows that religion and medicine are quite closely related. What is religion based on? It is based on faith. And faith is a cornerstone of medicine. Faith is a healer. We all know that. I won't go into the details of that. And how does faith act? Faith acts on the mind. It is a feature, shall we say, of the mind. And how does that act? The mind acts on the body. But no one knows exactly how this mind-body complex work. It is indeed a subject of research in many institutes, in many places of advanced research all over the world. I have also written an essay on euthanasia. I thought this was going to be an easy essay, but I was mistaken. It was rather a difficult thing to write, not only because of its philosophical overtones, but because of its legal overtones, not being accustomed to those legal overtones. I read many judgments. I have reported extensively on a few which I thought were important. I just can't help feeling and considering that I have fact, the fact that I spent a great number of hours of the day dealing with very ill people, with the dying and the dead, I still can't get over the fact that it is wrong for a doctor to practice like a god in his medical profession. He can't draw the line. He is not able to draw the line. At the same time, I honestly feel that when death is near, when death is close, it is wrong to prolong the agony of death, wrong to make death degrading, lonesome, and often ruinous to the patient and to the family. I've written an essay on three modern discoveries, and I've chosen penicillin. I think modern medicine began really with the discovery by Fleming of penicillin. I've taken cortisol and I've taken the discovery of the DNA molecule by Watson and Crick's. Penicillin and cortisol I chose just to illustrate how fortuitous circumstances, how chance, how good luck, how a conglomeration of all these has led to some fantastic great discoveries in medicine. Cortisol, for example, disparate circumstances one far away from the other, coming suddenly at an opportune moment altogether, and you have a discovery. I discuss the discovery of DNA by Watson and Crick's for two reasons. It is probably the most important discovery of the 20th century, on a par with the discovery of the circulation by William Harvey in the 17th century. But the reason I got involved in this narrative was to show how great intelligent minds can also be sometimes petty. To show what rivalries exist in the, in the research that goes into medicine. And how the group headed by Watson and Crick's triumphed over the group that was doing the same research at the King's College in London. Triumphed, perhaps to my way of thinking, by a rather unfair means. I have also written on contemporary medicine. I do not want, I did not want to sing the praises of contemporary medicine and I say you live in their midst. You know what contemporary medicine is capable of, what marvels it has performed, marvels which would have been thought unthinkable, impossible, 30 years ago, if not even 50 years ago. I have preferred to paint some of the blotches, some of the dark spots. 
on the canvas of contemporary medicine. And then, having a kaleidoscopic view of the past, living in the strife and the turmoil of the present, I thought it best to end with medicine in the future. Medicine in the future has great possibilities and great dangers. Medicine in the future is going to pose great ethical quandaries which man will have to solve. I'm not quite sure whether medicine in the future will lead us to a brave new world, not the brave new world of Aldous Huxley, it's book worth reading, but a true brave new world where all of us are blessed with a chance, good health, happiness and contentment. Or is it, if I look at the other side of the coin, that medicine might be great on the shoulders and reefs of the increasing hubris of advancing science. And when I finished all this, I realized how closely the past, the present, and the future are intertwined. This is not an original thought. It's been spoken of by Samans, by prophets, in the scriptures, by philosophers. But amazingly enough, in the last half of the 20th century, by some of the great minds in physics who have felt the link between time at all points. But then who can express it better than the poet? When he says, time present is present in time past and time future, and time future contained in time past. So here you have it, ladies and gentlemen, most of the essays which I have briefly mentioned. It's a slim book. As I said, it's a stand laurel of a book. I hope those who wish to read it enjoy it. And I wish them really happy reading. I hope they enjoy it, not the whole of it, at least bits of it. Now I just need two minutes more to thank so many people I want to thank. I remember my parents for having given me the values that have stood me in good stead. My thanks to my wife, Vida, most of all. The very, very little that I have achieved would have been impossible without her love, her care, and her support. My children, very good, Shirin Jan, and my grandchildren, a source of great joy, pride, pillars of strength, always at our side. I thank my secretaries, Patricia and Maggie, for having shielded me from the vicissitudes, the slings and arrows of the outside world and allowed me to cocoon myself and uh, work in splendid isolation. I thank Anita Garwale. Thank you, Anita. I wouldn't know what we would have done if you couldn't help in the arrangements as this always when you gives me a nostalgic feeling. It was on this very stage that I sat 52 years ago, in 1956, I think, when I was at an award-winning ceremony of the University of Bombay after I had my doctorate in medicine. Murli and Emma Devra, I thank you. It was you who egged me to hold this, otherwise it would never have been held. And you said, how can anyone know that you've written a non-technical book if you don't release this book? Thank you. Thank you, Dina, for your kind words. I must thank Your Excellency for accepting our invitation to preside. Thank you, Dr. Indusan. I'm very grateful to you. Thank you, Murli, again for being here with us. Thank you, Dr. Manzal Khan. We have had a great association with the Oxford Press. It seems almost as if I am credited to the Oxford Press. And thank you, Haji, my dear friend, for giving me a great, grand surprise. I am indeed so touched that I can barely speak. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, all of you, my friends, my colleagues, 
my doctors who worked with me, my boys and girls who still work with me, my nurses, the institutions I worked in, the JJ, the British Candy, the Kasi General Hospital, all of you ladies and gentlemen, and some of you who made a special effort to come here, thank you Pratap, thank you Eva, and thank you Nagesh, thank you and all.